Max Harris was awaiting surgery on an aortic aneurysm, as you do, when he decided to take the exams for a prestigious fellowship at All Souls College, Oxford. He not only got through the health scare, but also won the fellowship, which allows him to spend seven years on open-ended scholarship at the college, with no teaching or publication requirements. The Auckland University graduate and Rhodes Scholar has two master's degrees in law and public policy, clerked for the Chief Justice of New Zealand and interned for Helen Clark at the UNDP. His writings published various places, including a chapter, The Politics of Love, in Morgan Godfrey's book, The Interregnum. Interregnum. And Max is back in New Zealand to speak at Aspiring Conversations in Wanaka today, alongside Deputy Prime Minister Bill English and pollster and commentator David Farrer. Max has got involved in the Oxford chapter of the protest movement, Roads Must Fall. I asked him to tell me about it. This is a debate that's really been started by students in South Africa uh, who last year wanted to take down a statue of Cecil Rhodes who was a coloniser and businessman um, in the University of Cape Town. And the debate after the statue was taken down sort of migrated to Oxford, where black students and students of colour drew attention to a lot of the statues and symbols of colonisation that are at Oxford as well. And the big focus at Oxford has been a statue of Cecil Rhodes on the high street um, above one of the colleges, Oriel College. And, yeah, over the last six months to a year, a lot of students have been talking about racism and representation at Oxford using these symbols as a centre point. Because it goes wider than just the statues, doesn't it? However, the campaign to remove that one particular statue at Oxford has been unsuccessful, right? Yeah, that's right. So the statues have always been a focal point for the broader issues. And, as you say, in January this year, uh, the college that owns the statue uh, had said that they were going to hold a listening exercise but cancelled this listening exercise so it looks like for now the statue of Cecil Rhodes is here to stay but what's happened in the last few months is the debate has sort of broadened uh, to focus on other sites in Oxford um, and to start talking about other issues like how many black British students get admitted to Oxford every year um, how do we deal with uh, racism that they and others experience on a daily basis at Oxford? How does Oxford address its colonial past? So, yeah, the, the statues have been quite a nice uh, starting point uh, for those debates, but the statues have never been the end of the matter. And some of the other things are going to take a lot more intention and time to address, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think people involved with the movement and, and this movement's very much led by, by black students and people of colour and, and black Southern African students in particular realise that and um, there's been yeah there's been a, a push for, for protest and, and activism and that's healthy I think at Oxford because Oxford can be a pretty quiet conservative place but then there's also especially in recent months been a bit of a turn to thinking about um, what, are, what are some of the kind of policy based and structural solutions to, to these issues of racism in Oxford. How did you get involved and why? I originally was running a discussion group called Alternatives, uh, which was focused on kind of alternative ways of political and economic thinking, um, and that involved a lot of people invo- uh, who were doing activism in Oxford, and the people in that group were actually at the forefront of Roads Must Fall in Oxford, and I just sort of got invited in, and uh, for me, uh, I'd, I'd been struck at Oxford by how little discussion there was of colonisation, having studied colonisation in New Zealand as part of um, going to school here and, and doing history at university, and so I really sensed that there needed to be more discussion about the links between the colonial past in the UK and um, what some would say is the colonial present. And then I'd also seen, unfortunately, incidents of racism with my friends being told they couldn't go into buildings without permission that I didn't need, for example. And These are so, students at Oxford and college buildings at Oxford. That's right, that's right, yeah. So um, unfortunately, yeah, I'd, I'd seen these incidents. I, I, I knew that but it's partly because there are so few black British students and and students of colour at Oxford that um, this racism crops up and there are a lot of shorthand judgments and so I'd seen that and I really felt like 
this is an important conversation to be having in Oxford. And I was also very inspired by some of the people involved who uh, thought very strategically and smartly about um, how this campaign was going to run. You were a former Rhodes Scholar. Um, I know you have two master's degrees. Um, did Cecil Rhodes' history and actions cause you any disquiet at the time when you accepted that scholarship? And what do you think about it in hindsight? Yeah, I definitely felt some disquiet um, when I initially applied, and it was a question that I was asked um, at my interview. You know, what what do you make of Rhodes' legacy and Rhodes' life? Um, I should have known more. I, I didn't know enough when I applied about the detail of Rhodes' actions, um, his contribution to early apartheid legislation, um, his coordinating of military massacres. And so actually part of um, my reason for being involved in Rhodes Must Fall was wanting other Rhodes scholars to be aware of the full picture of Cecil Rhodes' legacy. And I do think there's a sort of duty on Rhodes scholars to raise awareness of, of that. Uh, and so in hindsight, I, I feel like I should have known more and, and that uh, we should all be aware of what Rhodes did um, and, and the, the gravity of, of what he did in Southern Africa in particular. Chris Patton, the Chancellor of Oxford, has said of the movement that if students can't engage with ideas with, in his words, the same generosity that Nelson Mandela did, then they should consider finding somewhere else to be educated, which strikes me as slightly disingenuous because what you were doing right, you would call another form of engaging with ideas, presumably. Yeah. Yeah, this this movement has always been about starting a debate and starting conversations. And I think a lot of us who are involved with the movement found that comment um, by the Chancellor pretty remarkable. It seemed while we were being told we were all about safe spaces in Oxford, it was the Chancellor who wanted a safe space where these challenging conversations couldn't be had. And so, yeah, it also seemed like not a good look for the university to respond to these claims of racism by students of colour and, and black students by telling those same students to leave rather than trying constructively to improve how the university deals with those problems. It seems to be an increasingly important topic in public debate at the moment here as well, yeah. the idea that potentially people who believe that being disagreed with is the same thing as being abused or being censored. There have been a lot of discussions online about this. I think there's also often a lot of uh, misunderstanding about what campaigns against racism are really about, and it's, it's sometimes easy to dismiss these campaigns as just being about wanting to be comfortable or wanting to avoid insults, when actually um, they're about a lot more than that. Uh, and so yeah, that's what we've been trying to do with Rosemus Fall, is, is to say, well, yeah, we're trying to start a conversation, not shut it down, and we're not just about safe spaces, we're about trying to achieve change when it comes to issues of race and representation in Oxford. But you're right, this is a, this is a sort of global movement that's emerging in not just Africa, but also America and Europe, especially being led by students. And to me, I think it's a movement about democracy, about who makes decisions about our values in university campuses, and also about power. It's a debate about who gets power in these discussions, and it's trying to centre the voices of people who've been powerless in the past. In New Zealand, Māori are underrepresented in academia and in student body populations at universities, and probably in curricula, though I'm not an expert on that and don't know. Do you think that this debate has implications for New Zealand, and is it likely to be had in New Zealand? Yeah, definitely, and uh, as with the debate in Oxford, I guess it's it's important to listen to what Māori and, and others are, are who are most affected are saying about racism on, on campuses and elsewhere in New Zealand. Um, but my sense is there are stories of racism. I saw racism in my time at Auckland University, and I know there are some emerging groups trying to address this. I think there's a campaign called I Too Am Auckland um, with stories of, of Māori and Pacifica talking about experiences in Auckland. So, yeah, I think this debate has, has real resonance in New Zealand uh, and, yeah, we're already seeing that acknowledged. You have been busy at Oxford. You're there for this prestigious and slightly unusual fellowship at All Souls College, which gives you a seven-year 
open-ended study remit, right, to study basically whatever you like for seven years, which is an incredible opportunity. Um, And one of the things you've been working on is called the New Zealand Project. Can you tell me a bit about that? This book idea came out of uh, being lucky enough to get this amazing fellowship and thinking about what would I love to write about if I could write about anything. And uh, this this happened at the same time as I I had a, a health scare and I ended up deciding I'd, I'd love to write about the future of New Zealand politics and how this country and this community can better harness some of the voices uh, in, in New Zealand that want our politics to be better. So the, the aim of the book, I guess, is to get back to a values-based politics and to widen and deepen the debate about New Zealand politics uh, and to try to apply three key values. And the values I focus on are care, creativity and community to different issues in New Zealand politics, like foreign policy, uh, prisons, um, the future of work and the workplace. Uh, and, yeah, I'm, I'm about halfway through the book uh, and back to, to talk about it a little bit here in Wanaka and, and hoping that um, it will also help to engage people that have opinions but feel excluded by the political process as it's currently designed. You had written about this values-based approach to politics before in your chapter in Morgan Godfrey's book, The Interregnum, which is called The Politics of Love. And for people who hear that idea and think, well, a politics of love is a nice idea, but (laughs) you are trying to address in this book, right, how it might have actual policy implications. Can you talk about some, some of the things you're thinking about in that area? I think it's a really natural reaction. Love feels like a pretty fluffy idea and to some like too deep an idea for, for politics. But in some ways, that's the whole point um, of the politics of love is, is um, trying to bring this, this idea that's really meaningful to us in our everyday lives um, into politics. And yeah, there are some concrete um, ways I, I, I try to apply that to politics um, in, the, in the chapter in, in Morgan's book. So um, I talk a little bit about um, the way we imprison people in New Zealand. And I think uh, the way our current prison system operates is in some ways really devoid of love. Um, I mean, there are some uh, exceptions to this, but I think uh, in most cases in New Zealand, when people go to prison, um, they're removed from their families. They're removed from uh, social contact, even though we're all social creatures. Uh, And so one thing I say is is a politics of love might involve um, a criminal justice system more committed to um, connecting prisoners up with their families and um, to rehabilitation, which shows love to the to the prisoners and their future, uh, and to thinking through alternatives to, to prisons. Uh, that's, that's just one area of application. But I really do think uh, this idea, uh, which Hillary Clinton's actually referred to, could have practical application. And it's a new value, and I think that's maybe part of its appeal to me, is we hear values like fairness and equality trotted out quite a lot in New Zealand political debate, but I think that debate's a bit tired. and We need some new, more meaningful values um, to get people excited about politics again, I think. You mentioned Hillary Clinton. Being pro-love feels like quite a trendy thing in American politics at the moment, doesn't it? Presumably it needs some kind of follow-through for the public to really believe that it could be a new kind of politics. Definitely, and I think one reason a lot of people feel alienated from politics is that uh, they hear a lot of rhetoric and not a lot of follow through. Uh, so I think there's a danger that if uh, this idea of a politics of love just stays at the level of rhetoric, that it could make people even more apathetic about politics. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a challenge for all of us is, is thinking about how, how this could be practically applied. Um, but I really do think we need a more loving politics. And I think um, this, this could also affect how we think about issues like um uh, welfare and then the benefit system um, and also refugees uh, and just as with other values um, like freedom or justice uh, we're going to have different views about what love means uh, and part of the process of, of hashing this out will be uh, different people arguing for what love requires. Yeah that would be a great public debate to have right because yeah a lot of the time you see lists of policies that could shake down out of a politics of love you look at it and think is that just a left-wing politics though or is the politics of love something you could see being applied across the political spectrum you know i think i definitely think it could be applied across the the political spectrum and 
Um, I'm sure uh, there's room for uh, an agenda more associated with the right that says, you know, rebuilding families as a project of love, or that on some people's views, freeing up the market, freeing up regulation might show love for some particular people. And I think there are going to be different interpretations of love. The key is just that love is the, the central value in that discussion. I think just centering that value could change how we see the relationship between people and politicians in New Zealand. What would it take, do you think, for the public and especially young people to want to participate in politics other than a return to some kind of authentic values? That's a huge question. Uh, And I've I've talked to a lot of young people in writing this book in New Zealand and elsewhere. And as you know, there are lots of reasons why people feel alienated from politics. Some of the common explanations I hear again and again are that people find politics boring, uh, that people think politicians are really petty and squabble too much rather than working together, and that politics doesn't deal enough with the long term. So I think uh, in the short term what we can do is try to encourage more bipartisan action, uh, try to encourage less squabbling, and then the politics of love sort of plays into that too, and and, and try to uh, encourage more thinking for the long term. But I also think there are some deeper causes of disengagement in New Zealand. I think a lot of people don't actually have a stake in the community and don't feel invested in politics and so don't feel like voting is worth their time. And I think that's a harder one to address, right? That's about a lack of community. And we also see that in in rising levels of loneliness in New Zealand. So that's going to take um, a much bigger project of reinvigorating community in New Zealand, making the excluded feel included and yeah, making people believe that politics is a vehicle that can actually address the needs in their lives. Max Harris. He's on a panel today with Bill English and David Farrer talking about the New Zealand Project at Aspiring Conversations 2016 in Wanaka.